I'm Rick Thompson, and that's the news for August 15, 2013. Excellent, Rick. Thank you very much. I know you, I believe you were, correct me if I'm wrong, were you at the uh, Grass Lake uh, Matter? I think you were, right? I certainly was. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. I so sure I want you to stand the phone. We're going to get, uh, I think combined, this next phone call is going to have as many years working on cannabis reform as prohibition has been going on. Um, <laughs> That would be, of course, our uh, dear friends, Chuck Reams. And I think on the call with him will be uh, the godfather of marijuana in Michigan, uh, Tim Beck. Am I correct in this, gentlemen? I'm here. Where the, 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 the technology is extremely limited, you know, in the area that where we're at. But we can hear you okay. Well, you're coming in loud and clear. Am I right about that? Between you and Chuck, you guys have as many years in cannabis reform as prohibition has been around combined, right? I don't know. I've been working. Uh, I did work on the Ann Arbor uh, $5 fine in 1972, but uh, I haven't been working continually. Uh, you could say that and get away with it, maybe. I'm going to. And I'm going to take some liberty. Working on my own, you know, in, I would say 2001, and then Chuck and I just, um, in 2004, all of a sudden, you know, I did this call from Chuck Ream. Who's Chuck Ream? Well, and somebody said, well, he sounds pretty credible. Uh, yeah, okay. He's given a ballot initiative with a medical marijuana in Ann Arbor. I said, whoa, whoa, that's good. That's really good. And then we just hit it off from there on, and we shared legal information, you know, and stuff that enabled both of the um, the ballot initiatives to win, you know, very successfully. Well, there's so much going on in that. <laughs> that's that's the reality, as I understand. I mean, that's how, I would say maybe collecting in, what, 20 years? I don't know what the hell. It's not even. Yeah. <laughs> 20, 22 years every day. Right. There you go. All right, so listen, there's a lot going on and almost too much to cover it all. And I know both of you gentlemen have been keeping up on things. And I, First of all, let's start with the uh, Grass Lake Shirky uh, event. Now, this was uh, billed as a uh, come out and discuss. Let's get our positions out there so all the interested parties, both from the law enforcement side, the community, the legislators, those that don't know can hear some of the arguments. It was not designed to be a debate. It wasn't a fight. It was to be a marketplace of ideas so you could, you know, hopefully see these people as working with them sometime in the future and, and finding a, a path. Tim, did they succeed? I would say your description of the meeting is accurate. Yeah, did they, uh, the Grass Lake meeting, I, I, I thought it was very, um, quite, you know, quite hopeful. And, you know, there's a million stories in the naked city, but, uh, you know, the community, I, I think, did very well. And I, I, I spoke with Shirky, you know, a- afterward, um, spoken with him in the past and some other folks. And, I, you know, there, 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 there's a possibility, I'm emphasizing possibility, that this uh, some de- kind of decrim bill would, would uh, get through the legislature uh, in lame duck in 14. That's my that's, that, that's what I'm thinking. Is is this because it is shirky? And, and, and tell our listeners, Chuck. I mean, Tim, this is your uh, this is your bag. Shirky is not the person one would expect to come forward and get behind this. I mean, maybe maybe he is, but but whatever. Is, he's he's a staunch uh, conservative Republican. Uh, he's, uh, I, I did have something to say on this one, and, and that is that yeah. our our issue has to be really single issue. We have to take support from wherever we can take support, wherever we can get support. And there are Republicans who believe in basic human rights and who believe in individual freedom, and we have to uh, get those Republicans to side with us. Michigan's uh, controlled by Republicans now, and there are Republicans, and Mr. Shirky is possibly the strongest one who truly believes in American values such as individual freedom. Uh, and still is a truly a conservative Republican. Well, we know as a as a community we have to we're going to get we need support across both aisles without question. And I'm not suggesting that there are Republicans that do believe in uh, liberties and families and protecting individual rights. There's no question about it. But he's significant. I was trying to draw the contrast of what most people on this side might disagree with his other social policies and positioning himself. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. And that's not relevant right now. But the point is that. He's a powerful player, and if he's behind it, there are other Republicans that just follow the party leader. You know, they'll vote Republican yep. every time. So it's significant that he's involved. Is he committed to 
pushing this through. I mean, he's the sponsor of the bill. Are we going to um, – he had optimism. He's the one, he, it was his office that organized that uh, meeting yesterday and called in the lead speaker, the law enforcement against prohibition speaker from Chicago. Yeah, he put that together, and I think he's taking a lead role now, which could be our only hope uh, in getting that deep grand bill passed at the state level. Let me ask Tim this. Is uh, Shirky strong enough to make the uh, king of the Senate uh, join him? Your buddy. Well, you know, I I don't know if he gets to that. These two are both pretty strong, you know, and they're going to, you know, want something, you know, out of the thing. It's not going to be a free lunch. I, I don't know what what it is that, you know, we're going to have to do, uh, you know, to, to get this. I, I, I don't think anybody... Include, uh, that I know of, including myself, is interested in you know reopening you know the MMMA you know the the one that the currently amended one. I mean, unless it was something so pro, you know, the cannabis community that uh, which is something natural. Yeah, well, what the hell? Let's just do it. You got the votes, fine. We don't got no problem with that. Uh, you know, on another, but and uh, and unless that is given, then no, they're they're not going to get anything through. I mean, if I'm making sense. Yeah, you're making sense. Um, tell me this. Uh, what was, uh, and I want to move on to some of the other initiatives that are going on throughout the state so we can let the community know what's happening on that. But, Chuck, what did you see, uh, like if you were a opponent and you were uh, there for that, you know, what, was the, what did you seem to hear as being the talking points or the you know, debate from, from that side? What, what, were the, what were the voices saying? Uh, in terms of opponents. Yes. Uh, well, it was great that the room was full of our own people, and that hearing that, that meeting couldn't have happened um, without our people there to pack the room. But there was uh, mainly just this one cop there who uh, wanted to be kind of liberal, but uh, he was a cop who was busting people for pot all the time. And what was the most amazing was he said, I don't go, we don't go after people for smoking pot, but but we have to deal with it while we're doing our other work. And then in his next paragraph, he explained how they fly a helicopter over everybody's house and uh, inspect it and then come and knock on their door and check, go check their outdoor grow. And, and the law, of course, as you know, says there's no, there can be no suspicion, no search, and no inspection. Uh, but uh, so in one, in one breath he says, oh, we don't go after pod people. In the next breath he says, we come and look at them uh, with a helicopter and then we knock on their door. Uh, but uh, And then, but the funniest thing, Michael, was even he said, well, I wish they would just legalize it. Now well, that was strange. But they, they, he doesn't, he's not really proud to be doing that work, but he says, if it's, if it's the law, I'm going to do my job, you know, blah, blah, blah. I've heard that over and over again. I, you know, I've heard many, many law enforcement agents say to me, you know, off the record, why don't they just legalize it already, you know? But um, I really wonder if that's I've true. Heard legislators say it. Yeah, but I wonder if that's really true. It's a way to kind of not engage in the debate a little bit, you know? You know, things are going yeah. sideways. You know, it's a way to just kind of, yeah, you know, just that's the answer. But is that really the answer? You know, I mean, I don't know if that's going to, there's still going to be laws when it's legal, right? I mean, there's laws about alcohol, there's laws about cigarettes, there's still the ways that people get in trouble for those things. You know, so, but, um, well, go ahead, Michael, I, what I, I suggested at the meeting, yeah, yeah, but here are some people that start in our community that started getting angry and almost semi, you know, belligerent, you know, to this, um, prosecutor, uh, and, and, and law enforcement person. He, he was extremely articulate, you know, and I guess we could be benign and call it devil's advocate or, he really believed it. I, I'm not sure, but he did say that why don't you just legalize it? That would solve us a lot of problems. <laughs> you know, but but uh, you no, know, some of the community got you know kind of angry, uh, you know, toward him because he was he seemed to represent you know the worst or some you know guy that's yeah you're busted, fuck you, that kind of thing. But right. um, you know he was very articulate, and and the thing of it is, I suggested that the problem is a political problem. We, we got to get the legislature you know, on board, you know, some entity like that. And, and that's really the one that they did. They don't fuck with that, you know, a, a, after a while, you know. And, and so this is why I was big on these Walsh bills. And, 
you know, I, I think there, we got enough ammunition, you know, in our um, stockpiles that, you know, they're, they're really, um, they're very close to defeat. That, that's my thinking. But, but the, but the guy, he, you know, he was all right. So I, and, and then, um, uh, and then, you know, folks settled down. That was the only thing that made me personally uncomfortable. I, I said, you know what, this is a political problem. He's only, you know, so whatever Mr. Sherpy and Mr. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, he, he, it was their, um, well, that that was really up to them, and they were king of the hill and all that at, at, at that point. He was the chief assistant <laughs> prosecutor for Macosta County. People don't understand sometimes that these people are acting as political props either. I'll tell you that. I certainly have uh, mistaken that before. They don't make it known. I mean, I think, you know, of all the weeks, you know, with this breaking news, the CNN story, you, you had to be under a rock not to, you know, have that cross your path in some of the media, any media outlet. And then Eric Holder, anyone in law enforcement, you know, that's big news also. I would think that of all the days to be, you know, I mean, from from like if it was last week that this thing took place, the perspective is completely different. You know what I mean? The, you guys were engaging in a debate at a time that like, you know, the momentum is flowing in that direction. It's almost like completely unnecessary to yell or get upset. It's just like, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, there's thousands of reasons to be upset. There's too many people that have been locked up, and I'm outraged by it. But as we stand here right now, their ignorance is going to, you know, lose. I mean, the truth wins. They know it's a failed system. The leading, the leading law enforcement agents in the state and the country, you know, articulated that it is failing, that there's unnecessary people in prison, that it's a waste of money. And ref- our dro- dro- Canadian, draconian laws, is that how he described them, that is a big news. So when that is happening, anyone that is not moved at least a little bit in that direction is going to seem to be out of line. Like that stuff about... Uh, go ahead. We just saw the shift. In the last week, we just saw the center of gravity shift. We just saw the critical mass be reached. We just saw... The wave pressed. We uh, now things are going to start falling our way, and uh, there is even something that <clears throat> is very exciting in Michigan that I can't even talk about yet. That I hope we can talk about soon. But uh, truly, you're right that I think, and I'm no, I'm not a Pollyanna here, but I really think that our issue with the Sanjay Gupta thing, with the Eric Holder thing, and on and not with the states legalizing and on and on. We have reached a critical mass, and we are going to be able to move forward now, even though there's going to be some brutal bumps along the way for some people. I would say that um, just to add to this, I mean, on Monday, you know, I've got a client that's looking at a mandatory five years in uh, federal prison. There's no offense, but we all have loved ones, unfortunately, that have been dragged away, people that we've engaged with that are in federal prison, senseless, senseless. And between Monday and Friday, I mean, you know, in this case that I have, they got the memo and they told us they're going to do exactly what he had said. I mean, that is like a paradigm shift. You know what I'm saying? Like, there is a ne- decrease in incentives for policing marijuana. At the federal level, down to, you know, at the top level, it got down to the, you know, into the, into the war, so to speak. And they chose not to blow the place up, you know, but just to, I don't know. You know that was a, Michael, if I may interrupt, that was a big deal. That was a real big deal, something like that. To me, that is deeply indicative, you know, that that I'm the part of, you know, for your client. You know, I mean, you've done something right here. And at the same time, I think there's there's a definitive policy shift. That was a big, big shot across the bow. That's, That's what I'm saying. I think. It wasn't just words, you know what I mean? It like actually was. It affected the human being's life between Monday and Friday. In fact, we were talking last night, Thursday, uh, Wednesday night, and uh, you know we were like, well, they haven't said anything about it yet, but I'm bringing it up. Like, what about the policies? They're going to be. And then, sure enough, this email comes. I was like, wow, this so is so much less risk for the client. That yeah, it changes the the entire structure within the courtroom. I mean, I just think the like the incentive to prosecute starts to go away if they know that there's going to be any leniency from the judge. And the argument, I think, goes is that the brutality by which the federal government treats it traditionally 
seemingly justifies the, you know, most, you know, opposing police officer because he's a believer in federal law. You know what I mean? But now when the federal stuff steps down, when you got all these communities saying, well, it's against the law, it's still illegal. Don't get me wrong. I'm not you know, suggesting. But just the shift in policy seems to take away those, you know, those state officials that, you know, claim it's illegal federally. I mean, that's the direction that this seems to be guided. You know, if they're going to treat it differently without mandatory minimums, then they would suggest that maybe they're going to let the states... Well, Michael, have- Michael, they commonly use that as an excuse. As an excuse. They did that in Ferndale. If anybody was at the Ferndale, you know, ballot initiative meeting, that's a common excuse, this federal government thing. And I'll tell you... That that foundation is crumbling. I, I believe it is, and, and this what what just happened for for you today and your client. This is big stuff. Well, let's talk about that other stuff. There's a number of different uh, successes at the local level. This has been a strategy that uh, has been working. I mean, it can go back to the 2004 the call that maybe you two talked about. Maybe you envisioned that we would be here at some point having this conversation. Who knows? I'll, I'm going to suggest that you did. You had the crystal ball. But um, here we are, you know, it started with the 2004 medical, you know, the local ordinances in Detroit, uh, where was it, Flint, and, no, no, in 2004, Detroit, Flint, and uh, Ypsilanti? No. Anyways. El Ferndale and Traverse City. Ann Arbor. Okay. Uh, Ann Arbor, that's, yes, yeah, Ann Arbor also, yeah. All right, and then, and no one ever, I mean, there was, I don't know, if, I know very few cases where somebody was utilizing those or it was really, and, but it was something that got it going. And then, of course, 2008 state law changing uh, the whole entire way Michigan looks at uh, marijuana from a medical perspective. And then a number of different ballot initiatives that have all, that passed throughout the state. Every year since then, some activity as we gear up for the elections now of uh, 2013, where, what, what cities are engaged? I know that all the signatures have been passed in. What's the status of those uh, those those cities right now? Which ones are they again? Tell the listeners, please. All right. Well, we, the big one is Lansing, and uh, we have a brilliant leader in Lansing. Um, we have a great leader, uh, Steve Sharp in Jackson. Jeff Jeff Hank is the leader in Lansing, and we have an initiative on the ballot in Ferndale as well. All three of our initiatives uh, this year are following the petition that Tim Beck got through the Michigan Supreme Court, that is, uh, that the uh, law in the city, the marijuana law, will stay in effect, except there will just be an exemption uh, that anyone, or an exception, that anyone over 21 on private property with less than one ounce uh, will uh, not be affected by that law. So that is what is on the petition in all three cities. Uh, we Since 2004... Uh, Tim and I have been involved in 10 local wins, and then there was the Grand Rapids one, which was completely independent of us, So, but that makes 11 local wins. Uh, when, uh, though we win the three this November 5th, that'll make 14. And uh, by God, I think that the voters have spoken, and I think that... Uh, Policymakers are going to have to realize that if it's a democracy, they're going to have to uh, reform their cannabis laws uh, because the people really have spoken. And I'll tell you, Michael, I do have something very exciting to say that I wish I could say, but I hope that I'll be able to tell you within a few days. Fantastic. You know, when you see the the voters come out time and time again, this is, of course, a strategy that's, that's been outlived that the more cities that are decriminalizing or legalizing, what have you, it requires the people in the city to vote on it. you got to get, you know, people get interested, and then they're going to, you know, you're going to have those people again for the, if it if and when it comes up for the state vote, if, if that situation ever. That's right. And the biggest out. cities in Michigan have voted yes. We already have the largest, and as Tim Beck always says, the best poll is the polling place, and we've got Detroit, Grand Rapids. We will have Jackson, Lansing. Uh, we've already got Flint, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, Kalamazoo. Uh, you know, we've got it one already, and uh, we just need uh, money to put things up on the ballot. But I think people, the American people are beginning to see this as an issue of fundamental liberty and freedom rather than having any to, anything to do with cannabis because they see people like me who've used cannabis 
extensively for 46 years and somehow still seem to be quite healthy. Yeah, it's interesting. In, in, in light of all these changing in votes, when you have a police officer, which I think was in Ferndale, was it the chief of police step up and say, I don't care what you guys do, I'm still going to arrest people. Those words become more offensive to more people. Like the group of people that would be offended right. by that get larger with the more of these things that start passing. It really, but it, but what else are you going to do, right? It's either that or, you know, I mean, it's you got to do, you know, but this is the strategy. It keeps people engaged. It gets them out of the vote. They're involved in the process. They understand the issues. It's, uh, That's right. You've got to have a tool. You've got to have some way to engage our opposition. You've got to have some way that the voter can express what they really think. And that's what Tim and I have done relentlessly is just keep putting it on the ballot over and over in the right places, in the right way, with petitions that are absolutely unquestionable uh, by any attorney and making sure each time that we win but uh, I think doing it over and over like this has really demonstrated that uh, the basic voter doesn't believe in this anymore, and they can see people's lives destroyed by the policy, and then they can also see the tremendous promise of cannabis for our society. I'm wondering, you know, just from a strategic standpoint, I know Shirky is behind the uh, decrim statewide, the statewide decrim bill, and he wanted to give a presentation, of course, to try to be objective so everyone could listen. But he, he brought in uh, Jim Garlick, who's going to be calling into the show a little while. So he wants to give this other perspective from law enforcement, obviously, to try to neutralize what may be, you know, traditional fear. Um, I'm wondering, whether have there been provided or was it discussed how, for example, Grand Rapids, in in the passage of their law, their uh, de decrim, what statistics they were you know offering was there any positive or negative results from that or any of the other cities that have uh had a shift in policy that you got you know from initiatives well in grand rapids they really have made an effort to shift policy and to have the police force get new instructions and the police force has uh uh made sure that their marijuana arrests uh decline they really had a good campaign that involved the whole community, and when they won, uh, they're really getting some results. Uh, some of our wins, like in Flint, uh, go essentially in Detroit. God knows what goes on in Detroit. But uh, in Flint, they essentially said, uh, well, we'll just enforce the state law, or we don't give a shit what good people say, uh, which, as, as you point out, uh, it only lasts so long in a democracy that the people can vote one and the public officials can do exactly the opposite and get away with it. I agree. I think the more interested people get in this, the more cities that happen, you're going to see this group of persons, uh, you know, voting people out. I mean, it's going to be a, it's going to become a more important issue for people in addition to the other traditional issues. You know, it's not going to be, you know, how are you in the economy? How are you on social issues? How are you in spending? What about the budget cuts? And what's your position on marijuana? You know, I think it's it's like getting there. You know, I mean, they tried yeah. to keep it out of the last, you know, election. So, like, I remember Mitt Romney being asked about he's in Colorado. They're like, "What do you think about medical marijuana?" He's like, "Come on, keep it to the issues, right?" I, yeah. And it was not a slam on the Republicans or Mitt Romney, but I just remember him trying to keep it out of the uh, the topic as he's standing there in Colorado, which is you know the leading state, so to speak, in terms of this issue. And I don't know. I just think that it is going to be in the. Uh, mainstream and, and and we should it should be right i mean that's the point of all this make people accountable right. it's for simply not going to be the case it's not going to be the case anymore that it's the third rail you can't touch in politics uh, people are going to from now on at least be able to have rational discussions of this policy and as we know cannabis prohibition doesn't stand up to rational discussion you, you have to change the policy that's right so what do you think um what do you think is uh, the next step for everyone? I mean, we stay this path, of course. Tim, what? Uh, where do you see like the next few months here? I mean, we're always curious to see uh, the effects. Of, but from the legislative perspective, are they actively working on this? Is there going to be more meetings like this? Is Shirky going to continue to go around the state and, uh, like one of our other uh, elected officials likes to do, talking well, about I, things? I, yeah, yeah, the, it, that's. You know, it's going to happen, but it's going to be private, you know, discussions right. at clubs and stuff like that. 
it's not open to the general public. And, and uh, no, it, it's, it's, the, it's the thing that's talked about very seriously. And, you know, again, I, I'm probably, re, you know, likely repeating myself, but I think uh, it's lame duck. There, there's going to be, I, I would guess there's going to be some action. And if not, we're, you know, we're going to provoke the action, okay? And, <laughs> you know, because there will be more cities that come under, you know, I'm not going to, well, let me ask this. To, to do you, do you, do you care? Well, I mean, let's put it that way. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, we're going to continue the process, and, and to the point where you know it's one city at a time, over and over again. You know, eventually, when all these boats come in, they're going to have to do something. It, it's just almost it's inevitable, and that's the strategy: is when these three, you know, this in in an off year, local elections. That's pretty heavy. That's a heavy message. You know, the conventional wisdom and science is that you, uh, well, you have to have a lot of voters. It should be a big turnout and all that. Well, I don't believe that. I've never subscribed to that theory. And, and Chuck and I have proven this over the years, that the basic core voter, the intelligent voter that shows up and votes in primaries is already turned on to this issue, which means we win every time we make the ballot. You know, in, in, a, in, a, in a city. So, I mean, part of the thing, and, and if any, there's any recruits or people that are interested out there, you know, we're probably going to have to make more moves in 2014, you know, on some ballot issues in some target cities. And, and to kind of, you know, the, do the coup de grace, you know, on, on um, you know, prohibition to some degree. And I would say, yeah, there will be some action on our behalf in Lane Duck. Ideally, 4271, some version of it, uh, whatever will pass, and along with something with some kind of, you know, decrim. And at that point, you know, hey, I, I, I'd almost be ready to retire. <laughs> and Chuck too, I think. You know, we're getting on in years. You know, we're old. You know, we're we shouldn't even be doing this. You know, we should be just, you know, off somewhere and, and, and just. But we, you know, we just have to do it for the time being. <laughs> Let me ask you this: um, Do you care? To, I mean, do you know? Has he has he taken a position yet, uh, Senator Jones? I mean, you know, with his uh, background in law enforcement, I wonder. No, no. I mean, I haven't had any communication with him. We're good friends, but and I don't pester him or, or waste his time. Uh, and we communicate obliquely. But what, what I understand, no, he's waiting it out. He wants to see what happens in the house first, and then he'll sure. make his move. Sure. And that's what that's I was wondering. It. I didn't know if this. I mean, ultimately, yeah. it's going to be. I mean, he's well, going to be. O- that's his official position. That's his official position. And, and right. you know, I can, you know, folks can understand it. He, he you know, he. No, I, I, you know, that, that's a logical answer, and, and, sure. and I, I, I don't know. He's, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's where he's at. Period. Right. Plain and simple. To speculate about what Jones is going to do about something or other, that's, it's not, not a good idea. I don't waste a lot of time about it. <laughs> Jones is waiting on, you know, actual real type events. Well, let's put it that way, and then he'll. No, I, I, just, I didn't up. know if he'd taken a position. He's taking, you know. Well, I'm going to see how much. No, he's no, got. no. He's. He's not. No, he's taking no official position. I mean, right. he he doesn't like drugged driving. Okay, he's right. really hardcore on anything having to do with driving and drugs. That that's the thing. It, you're, he's been very explicit about that. It's sure. best not to even argue with him too much. Uh, you know, and then he ha- he has a um, uh, thing about criminals. You know, predators. Uh, you know, getting right. into the system. You know, he wants those type of people expunged. He don't want them to be involved in marijuana. They that they need to be continued to be, well, you know, banned or whatever. <laughs> you know, and on the other hand, he, I mean, he wants a regulated system. That that's really what he wants. You know, You're and, and we're just working every day. Yeah, I'm sorry. Someone said, he, yeah, they're driven underground. You know, a topic came up recently. I forgot. Uh, I don't usually, put, but but. I found myself leaving a comment in some maybe newspaper article uh, that it suggested that the uh, state would take over the growing of marijuana, or that the state somehow take, you know, a uh, a shot. I, I don't think that's true, but you know, I'm going to have Chuck handle that one. 
Okay, no, ask wait, wait, him this, please. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, I don't agree with this. I'm just saying some have suggested. Hey, what's up? I said, you know, that's, you know, some people. I, I'm not suggesting this, but the question came up about, you know, who's going to be the ones in charge of the growing of marijuana and regulating and stuff. I mean, you know, right now, you know, we've got some of the systems that are set up. It's the state's much more involved with, you know, what's coming out of the ground and going, you know, how it gets to the patients. Um, Michigan is not that kind of law. We, uh, you know, let the caregivers grow in their basements. When, and that's the state of the law right now. But uh, I just was asked, more curious if uh, there's talk at the state level of uh, any uh, of them, you know, someone getting involved in the business of growing marijuana, you know, uh, whether they're subletting it out. I'm not sugge- I, I'm opposed to this. I'm just wondering if they're interested in this discussions coming out. Sometimes this is the, you know, looking at other states, they're they're getting themselves more engaged. Any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I haven't heard anything specific in what you're talking about, about turning it over to any other kind of system or having any more... Uh, having it any more tightly controlled, uh, I haven't heard anything specific uh, about that. Of course, we'll always be looking for that, and we'll always be trying to have as open a system as possible with people being able to grow their own, like in Michigan, and grow for the dispensaries, uh, like in Michigan, uh, with the ultimate goal being free, legal, backyard marijuana uh, with commercial sale uh, being regulated somewhat like alcohol. Amen. All right, listen, um, without further ado, I want you guys, if you can't stay on, if you got to go, I, I, I wanted to thank you for being here, but we do have Jim Garrick, Garrick uh, the, uh, he's an attorney, I believe, and actually a uh, prosecutor. Yeah, gr- and, great uh, he speaker. Spoke, and, uh, great speaker. He spoke at this other event that we had in, at the Lansing Capitol a little while back in uh, 2011, and um, sorry, I don't have a better bio on him, but uh, Without further ado, Jim Garrick. Jim, well, welcome. I think we had you on last time when you were in town uh, a while back. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you, and uh, I had a great time uh, in Michigan uh, visiting some of your public officials there, uh, uh, liberals, conservatives, meeting on a middle ground to talk about drug policy reform. How amazing, right? Yeah, he was a brilliant speaker, a brilliant speaker, too. And you can't see here on uh, the telephone uh, how handsome uh, he is and what a tremendous presence <laughs> that he has <laughs> in the room. And so he really <laughs> should be somebody making a commercial we, we take whatever, whatever uh, for us uh, because uh, he has a great uh, presentation. Very good. Well, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, it was interesting to see. Uh, the mixed bag of the of the audience that we had, uh, there were people there that were interested in uh, marijuana reform, and there were people that are interested more generally in drug policy reform. But the 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 night was made by uh, really the two politicians who were there: the representative Mike Shirky, uh, who was basically identified as as a conservative uh, politician, and Jeff Irwin, who's who's described more as a progressive or liberal. And the, and the two of them agreeing that this topic of uh, marijuana and drug policy reform needs to be discussed. And the focal point, of course, was House Bill 4623, which these uh, two uh, politicians from the opposing wings of the political parties have both jointly endorsed and supported that would have the effect of decriminalizing uh, marijuana uh, uh, in quantities of under an ounce which is not a lot, and it's not legalization, but it's certainly a dramatic change from what Michigan law is at the present time. And and it, and it uh, the mere fact that they introduced the bill and they did it jointly and provided a town hall meeting uh, to discuss it uh, affords the, the public the opportunity to hear the discussion, the pros, the cons, and see that uh, uh, reaching across the aisle is really not so far as we often think of it. Yeah, well, this is Tim Beck. Uh, I, I I would agree with you that, that that's kind of this is augurs you know very well you know for us that these these two two um, uh, gentlemen from you know the extreme wings of of both parties are you know are together on this one. And there's others out there. I, I you know I know of another one. I'll, I'll mention his name. Uh, I mean, well, he's he's not a co-sponsor of this bill, but Tom McMillan. You know, is one. I mean, this guy was founder of the, the Christian Coalition of Oakland County. You know, back in mm-hmm. the nineties, that's how he got his start. 
you know, and, and um, you know, you don't, don't, you don't want to argue with the guy. There's no value in you know, talking about abortion or, you know, gay rights and on and on. Just let it ride. You know, now on another mm-hmm. level, he has a, a view of other, you know, uh, social, uh, you know, customs and so on and so forth, and he doesn't seem to have a hard on for drugs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. again, on a political level. You know, it has to be done very, you know, carefully in order for him and others to, you know, make sure that they're, well, doing the right thing and that they're going to get reelected and maybe mm-hmm. even move on to higher office. So what you're saying, yes, it's very significant. It's very well, significant. There, there, there's really much much to agree on. Uh, you know, some, some people believe that government should be smaller, government should be less intrusive into personal uh, people's business. The government shouldn't put their nose in uh, between a doctor and a patient. Uh, the, the people should be free unless they're hurting or bothering somebody else. Um, we, that we should have smaller governments spending less on prisons. Uh, and of course, Michigan is spending some two billion dollars a year. That's that's two thousand million dollars a year. Uh, at, at the same time, when it's reducing the spending on higher education by 15 no, percent. Mara, I think you're getting off topic. Let, let, no, no, let me explain something. I, it, we're talking about cannabis policy. What? Cannabis, purely focused on cannabis. I think we've isolated $325 million that's going strictly toward marijuana, cannabis, anti-cannabis activities. That's real money. Okay, I don't know about you, but maybe it's just chump change to some people. But you know, we've isolated that number. That is a significant line in the state budget. Okay, and all they got to do is tune it down, and they've got another three and a quarter, you know, right there to do something for roads or schools or you know lower taxes or whatever their their pet thing might be. Well, I so think, I think, certainly, I think there are certainly uh, many, many greater uses than putting money in, into prisons to lock up nonviolent uh, drug users, whether they're smoking marijuana or using some other illicit substance. The fact of the matter is the war on drugs is the heart of what's wrong, and, and these uh, politicians are affording an opportunity uh, to discuss it. And, of course, you know, much, well, much, of, the, much of the focus, Jim, has been, you know, this you know, policy regarding – changing in, in, in reform of, of marijuana, of course, we're all very passionate about that. And I know it's, a, you know, from a LEAP perspective, which is an organization made up of professionals who have been involved with the law enforcement side of things, they're not people that are advocating the use of drugs. They're not people that say they use drugs or good, drugs are good for you. It's just the opposite. No one likes that. No one wants those kind of other things. It's the principle that you're articulating, which is this is a failure. And no matter what you try to do to fix it, it just makes it worse if you keep investing money in arresting people and the time to change i saw fast i saw one of the other leap people on a uh interview and you know they were uh the um news reporter was you know you're a police officer what are you saying you want things legalized you know and then they actually began to question like would you know would you go out and try heroin tomorrow you know of course not and and the view of cigarettes even today has become completely changed i mean people are scowled upon they, people who smoke cigarettes have no rights to smoke so they can do it but it's a uh, negative thing and that came from education that came from health and it was looked at it from a completely different perspective so i mean how do we get this message out there what is the what is the path to uh, victory on this jim well the the reason the drug war is going to end is because it causes so many crises in so many different ways that we will not be able to afford the bills we're unable to pay them at the national level the state level the county level the city level uh because uh, so much money is frittered away. You know, we talked about prisons a moment ago. Uh, there's nothing you can do with a public dollar that is more wasteful than to hire somebody to watch somebody else do nothing, which is exactly what <laughs> happens in prisons. And, and yeah. in the United States, we have 5% of the population of the world, and we have 25% of the world's prisoners. We have 2.3 million people behind bars, many of them there for nonviolent drug offenders, to the point where even the Obama administration and Eric Holder are now saying it's time to turn loose and, and, and revise the sentencing. Uh, well, they didn't say turn loose. I wish they'd say turn loose. Some of these nonviolent uh, offenders, but certainly calling for an end to these mandatory minimums that remove discretion from judges 
and, and, and force judges mechanically to sentence people with no prior background to prison for draconian drug sentences, for nonviolent offenses, for marijuana, and other substances, which, which is just uh, an abuse uh, of the prison system. And when we, when we prioritize the prosecution of people for consensual drug crimes, quote-unquote crimes, uh, what we do is we deprioritize serious crime. And, and, and at the moment, the police are rewarded by working drug cases because they get uh, half of the money locally and half goes to the feds, uh, whereas if they're solving a rape or an armed robbery or a murder, they don't get a piece of the action for solving the case which is a temptation for chiefs of police and, and cities and villages and counties to be assigning their men to be working drug cases instead of crime. And, and, let, me, and let, me play, the, let, okay. let me play, uh, you know, I'm going to be a really brutal cop, just some real thick asshole, all right? And, and let me throw out a, uh, well, I, I know I'm just being devil's advocate. Let me play devil's advocate, all right? You know, the the idea is, well, when you talk about rapes and murders, well, we don't have anything that in our county, our county is really clean, and 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 uh, crime is virtually under control, and and you know we just don't want to make have drug gangs infiltrating our county, so we need to we we shouldn't change the law at all because we can use the law you know to get these people that are probably tied in with drug gangs and criminal enterprises. So why should we do anything? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm being real here. This is this is I'm, you know, I'm being as young, real as I possibly a young lady, can. A young lady, uh, Charmy Colson, who I was with uh, for uh, a part of uh, my travels here these last two days, and one of the things she did was to supply statistics, which I wish I had in my hand at the moment, to show that that in fact there are murders. In Jackson County, she brought in statistics to show that there were eight murders, not a single one solved. And, 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 the, and that the solve rate on murders and armed robbery and rape and burglary and serious uh, crimes w- was was next to nil. And if you look at uh, arrests for uh, prostitution and, and, and other, uh, you know, and drug use crimes, uh, that were the two highest percent of calls in and, and arrest, so that there's no question that the resources of law enforcement have been misdirected into the fight on the war on drugs, which, which has been inimical uh, to the to the public health, safety, and welfare. Instead of working serious crime and taking violent offenders off the street, we have policemen sitting around watching and, and surveilling to see who's smoking what, which, which is is just a hilarious misuse of of public funds. Limited well, he claimed, he claimed, no, he claimed he doesn't do that. They claim they don't do that. That never really happens. The only he people that they don't do are it. bad guys. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being, they, hey, come they, on. They, 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 the county of, of Jackson received uh, some $300,000 in money from forfeited uh, uh, property from drug dealers in, in the prosecution of drug crimes. And if they want the well, 300000 that's, that's fucked up, if you will, no one here. <laughs> Listen, Jim, I want to ask you something, because you were, you were making a very important point that I've talked about a lot. I think it cannot be understated. Without the uh, reform of forfeiture, what incentive does law enforcement have? And that really raises the bigger question, which is, as righteous as your message is that it's just not working, there is a industry that exists of the people that we employ and, and pay to you know, protect and serve the community, you know, and the ways that they fund themselves is from this particular activity. You know, and even though each of us have heard police officers say, you know, they should just legalize it, you know, where is the police community on this really? You know, h- how can they step away from this rich nutrient source of resources that keeps them going, you know, keeps them building, gets them bigger tanks and more helicopters? How, you know, how do you, you know, how do you stop that? Well, I think it's human nature uh, to to want more. And at the moment, the war on drugs is providing a a way for drug dealers and street gangs to make more because they're in favor of prohibition. And and unfortunately, there are some uh, law enforcement officers who are supportive of the drug war because uh, it is, in fact, these monies that 
uh, pay overtime, hire more police officers, uh, and and uh, buys the squad cars uh, and 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 the weapons and the flak jackets and and uh, and and so forth. So it's hard to say, oh, I don't want that money. It's hard for for the county of Jackson to say, I don't want the three hundred thousand that are coming from this forfeited money. But police officers sh- should should uh, first and foremost want to protect the public. Not not because two people are sharing a cigarette uh, or, or a pot uh, joint or, or or some other consensual activity. They should be out there trying to make the streets safer for uh, for for the public for kids. And and uh, you know in, in Michigan we've got a city that's uh, that's bankrupt where where people uh, need jobs where there's insufficient money to pay the bills. Uh, where, where the crime rate uh, for the last 25 years has put the, the Detroit in, in the top uh, 25, uh, 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 the top 10 of the most uh, criminalized, uh, violent uh, cities in the country. And, and instead of using money to help problems like that, we're, we're spending it um, uh, on, on this foolish war on drugs. Do you think and part of the message? The people, do you think part of the message needs to be? You know, involving those dollars, you know, a, 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 a actual solution for the perceived. I mean, we understand if, if they have more time and they're not involved with resting, you know, drug activity, they're going to have more time to work in the other stuff. But they seemingly would be less funded. I mean, you know, where's the turnaround, they might argue, in terms of us being able to maintain the force that we have. So does the message have to include, other than just savings, of you know, I mean, because essentially you're going to be cutting up, you know, the need for police officers potentially. Does there need to be a message of, you know, revenue producing with the legalization of these drugs? I mean, is that part of it to kind of offset it until those dollars are actually realized with the transition? You know what I mean? Well, I mean, police officers should be doing police work. They, they they shouldn't be supervising and, and kids who are using some substance or some sick person and whether or not they're they're violating the rule because they've got 13 plants instead of 12. Uh, and uh, and and a police officer should want to, to to attend to this serious crime and not be a babysitter for for what society or some kid is doing. Uh, that, that's against some consensual law. We never should have made it against the law to begin with. And whether whether there's some shift in revenue, well, I don't think we should have policing for profit. We shouldn't have bail bondsmen that are that are that are, that are making money uh, to, to run a bail bond system. In Illinois, we we have a we, we have a system where the, where the, you pay ten percent, you're out on bond, and the and the court gets to to, to keep ten uh, percent of the amount that was posted. So you get ninety percent of what you got posted back. But we we shouldn't be in the business of uh, right. uh, policing for profit. And I mean, the answer, I'm going to answer. I'm going to add to the answer that you gave, which is that you know the query that I posed is really this is really that it's gotten too big because of the war on drugs. There's this perception that we need all of that, you know, and the fear of needing to cut back on that because the the money being made from the forfeiture isn't going to be there is not is not a, a bad thing, you know, if if they can reduce what we're considering crimes and use those resources in other more positive ways, we're going to, you know, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to change the earnings, right? Because, but, but inevitably Michael, you're going to have to lay off police officers. Am I right? You know, I mean, I, uh, I attrition, attrition, if we reduce crime, uh, Clinton said we need to hire 100,000 more policemen because society is so violent. It's so violent because we put in place prohibition. We can have safe streets or drug prohibition, but you can't have both, one or the other. And we have, unfortunately, elected to have this war on drugs, which means streets are unsafe. The, the kids are funded uh, uh, by, by drug war uh, profits in, in, in the black market because all these substances are illicit and illegal, which takes something that grows on plants and makes them the most valuable commodities on the face of the earth. We can reduce crime, have less need to be hiring more police, more prison guards. Um, during the 1990s, the fastest growing housing in the United States was prisons. 
It's a foolish waste of money. When you pay money for prisons, it's money you can't spend on schools, job training, uh, and and, and uh, daycare, health care, things that matter and improve the quality of life for people. Am so, I still on, Michael? This yes. is Chuck. Am I still yes, on? Chuck. Yes. You know, I wanted to ask um, you, Chuck, okay. what do you know about, what do you know about uh, Irwin's forfeiture reform bill? Is that getting any uh, traction? I know he had... Um, but it, hadn't it been introduced uh, a measure to reform some of the... No, I, all I know is that he has planned to introduce it, and he will demand a conviction prior to any forfeiture uh, on uh, Jeff's forfeiture bill. He has another bill which relates to uh, criminal informants, and it will require that any criminal informant under the age of 18... Uh, the police would have to have the parental consent. Uh, I think that's another real good one. I was thinking about um, the loss of uh, profit when the police have to give up uh, robbing uh, citizens uh, with civil forfeiture. Uh, We could even uh, make some sort of uh, money for local law enforcement part of the taxes that could be generated by uh, legalizing uh, cannabis. Well, I I might be mistaken, but I think the revenues projected for Colorado or maybe even actually already collected are like $200 million. The the dollar sums that are coming in uh, as as a result of the tax on on, uh, medical marijuana sales are humongous, Uh, much more than people were anticipating. Yeah, part of that. So I mean, I mean, there's. Given to I mean, we need to do two two things. We need we need to end the drug war so we stop creating so many crises in so many different departments, uh, and and there'll be less violence in society, and we'll have public monies to to fund uh, things that are still important. We still have to solve murders, rapes, and robberies, and 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 just because we end the drug war doesn't mean that the police aren't going to have something to do. I don't think it's realistic to think somebody's got to worry about being laid off. But on the other hand, we're not going to have them policing for profit. We're not going to have them sharing in the bounty uh, uh, of the money that's recovered. And and, and, sure. and forfeiture reform needs to be not only uh, that that uh, that we have probable cause and court decision before we run off and abscond with the money, uh, uh but we need rules that say that the money doesn't go to law enforcement to begin with. It should go into yep. the general revenue funds rather than be allocated to the, to the police, giving them an incentive uh, and, and, and to sometimes step across the line uh, in, in order to, to take someone's property. And, and I think that temptation, um, can, which can affect credibility, testimony, affidavits uh, uh, that, that, that lead to the confiscation, uh, an eventual forfeiture of property is is an evil, an evil in the very integrity of the system, of the criminal justice. Yep. So, much room for reform. Well, the uh, one of the core evils of the system right now, for sure. So, <clears throat> I mean, I always felt that you know one of the things that what seems at least from the outside, much of the Colorado and the areas that, you know, the areas that have a proved it where it's legalized and the police are actually getting along with it. I think, you know, in the back of their mind, you know, they, uh, you know, if you, if you know, I don't care who you are, if you know that the school your kid's going to is well-funded and has, you know, got good teachers and, you know, there's, you know, it's, it changes everything. And I think that everyone has, you know, the same goals of that. They have a, you know, better community financially stable in some way. And I think that's part of the, uh, Part of the uh, path that will uh, change the way that people think. The question is, uh, what is uh, what do you think about uh, what is the thing that you're still running into, Jim, when you go and speak with, uh, you know, a less uh, a less um, you know appeasing or you know a crowd that may be a little bit more adverse to the the concept. What are the things you're hearing today in 2013 as you go around? Has the arguments changed? I mean, we always hear about the kids, the children. Um, that's always one of the ones I like to throw. What, what are the what are the oppositions taking right now? How, how receptive were the people? Well, <laughs> well, one one of the big changes that I I've seen is in the public attitude. It, it, if in 1989 when I gave my first war on drugs cease, 
the speech, if you mentioned the, the word legalize, control, and regulate uh, in the same sentence with drugs, it would cause brain cramps and you would lose the audience uh, immediately. But but the war on drugs has failed so mightily and so long and hurt the public in so many different ways that the public themselves are now passing these referendums to legalize marijuana uh, and, and, and looking for ways to escape from the harm that's caused by the war on drugs. The, the people who are on the other side of the coin who are benefiting financially, the, the, the drug war gravy train riders, they're, they're still making whatever arguments they can. The former head of the DEA who runs a, a, a business of, of selling uh, drug-free workplace uh, programs to Fortune 500 and other companies is, uh, in fact, in favor of continuing to prohibit even medical marijuana. And why, why is that? Here, here's somebody who's making money uh, off, off of selling drug testing and, 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 and other uh, drug, drug-free uh, workplace ideas. And, and why does he resist even marijuana, the least benign of the illicit substances? And the answer is because when you use cocaine, amphetamines, uh, meth, uh, PCP, and these other things, the body processes them so quickly that they're out of the system. So if you've got a drug testing business, you're going to be getting a bunch of negatives uh, uh, when you test somebody 24 hours later. But if you've got uh, marijuana against the law, even medical marijuana, Somebody can be smoking something uh, two weeks ago or a month ago and, and still going to be turned up positive on the test. So if the guy turns up positive on the test, now we can continue to make them come and, and do drug drops. We can make them go see the drug counselor. We can provide these services for which we can charge the money. So in, in my my judgment, it's uh, it's scoundrel. Well, is there such a word, scoundrel fool? <laughs> you have to be a scoundrel. Uh, to be willing our... to make money in in, in that fashion, and uh, the the answer is to uh, uh, to accomplish some of these drug policy reform ideas that so many people are now talking about and calling for. A majority of Americans at the moment are in favor of the legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes. There are now 20 states that have approved medical marijuana, and half the states approved by state legislatures. And, and the other uh, half approved by the voters themselves. Politicians are afraid to take on the people where they've expressed their will through referendum. So uh, President Obama and, and uh, Attorney General uh, Holder are, are, are sitting there not anxious to be taking on the voters of Colorado and Washington because the people themselves are leading drug policy reform. They're not following the the political leaders. They're leading the political leaders. And, and, and there are one. There's one group of people that really does lead in the drug policy reforms, and those are the citizens of uh, the city of Ann Arbor, or some attorneys call it the People's Republic of Ann Arbor. But uh, we, I'm thinking, and there's a group, uh, one group coalescing to possibly challenge two gigantic industries right in Ann Arbor with the uh, technique of the local initiative that we have perfected. Um, One, we could say that uh, in Ann Arbor, no uh, one who's arrested in Ann Arbor or Washtenaw County even uh, will be subjected to a P test uh, for marijuana and that no one would go to a private prison and uh, put those two issues separately on the ballot. And then both of those industries, both of those industries would be called out to come to to, to come to try to justify themselves. I I have to interject uh, that in my opinion, no one should ever go to a private prison. No one should be able to make money off of running some kind of a slavery operation where where they they yep. they take take people in and, and feed them like animals and deprive them as much as possible to increase the black line. It should be a government service. If the people want to lock up 2.3 million people, the taxpayers should get every dollar of the bill and not yep. try and find some way to skirt the obligation for the harm that they cause by supporting an idiotic war on drugs, which is public enemy number one. So I, I, the, when I hear about private prisons, it, 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 it just reminds me that this country 
used to have an institution of slavery, which, which we basically, uh, according to Michelle Alexander in her book, The New Jim Crow, have put back in place in this country, where we, yeah, every- we, we arrest at ten times the rate in the United States of the people in, in European countries because of our idiotic war on drugs. And, and if somebody's making money off it, it used to be Wackenhut, which just changed their name now. But I, I at one yeah. time was so aggravated with our war on drugs, and we're going to build all these prisons as we were. I, I said, you know, the people don't want to listen. I want to buy, buy Wackenhut. And so the stock goes up in value, and after about a month, I think, you know, I feel like I'm owning stock in slavery and sold yep. it there because I don't want to earn money uh, over somebody suffering in some kind of penal institutions, oftentimes where it's because the war on drugs is locking people up for, for something that shouldn't be a crime to begin with. Excuse me Absolutely. for getting enthusiastic there, but no, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad. It's a private sign. Private prisons are a oh. sign that we've fundamentally lost our way as Americans, and we've got to re-find it. Listen, I want to do something that we don't usually do. We got about uh, 15, 20 minutes left. I want to go to the medley round and take some callers. A lot of people probably want to get in there and uh, talk. Uh, we go first to this. I'm sorry, uh, I got to leave, Michael. But, uh, All right, thanks. Chuck, you're taking up over. Chuck, thank you very much, by the way, and, and Tim Beck as well. Uh, two. Great comment to go out on, Chuck. Yes. Very, very good. Thank you. And my thank best you, gentlemen, so much for all all that you do. Appreciate that thank very much. Good night. And thank Have you, a Jim. great night. Back to the well, Godfather. Okay, my pleasure to be with you. No, Jim, Jim, stay around, strong if you can. I want to take a couple of calls if, you, if, if possible. We've got this uh, 248 number on. Please uh, call her. Uh, you're on Planet Green Trees with uh, Jim Garrick of the uh, LEAP organization, Law Enforcement against prohibition. Hi, is that me? Yep, it's you. Uh, I uh, just wanted to say thanks for doing the show and, and all you do for the movement. Any and, questions? Uh, my question, my question is uh, on the MMMA forms. Somebody brought up uh, Section Six confidentiality, and I was just wondering if that could be used to prevent police from reporting confidential patient information to the prosecutor. Well, what, what ultimately happens is when, when the police ask for a card, they're going to identify it and try to determine if it's valid or not. You know, this is an interesting issue, I think, uh, and uh, I'd be curious to hear Jim's thoughts on it and, and, and if, you know, he's got a position. I mean, the, the ultimate issue is the Privacy of the patient's medical condition. We don't want that. You know, there's certain principles that we don't want to release that information. But when you, the, I think the police would argue when you assert the medical condition as being the um, reason for this exception is the way the law is written, they want to verify that and they need to, you know, I'm not talking about the condition itself, but just getting the card and the information. In fact, the law does allow a minimal amount of information to be verified. It does not include, per se, the patient's specific condition, what their disability is, none of that is relevant. The issue is more or less that the card itself can be validated as being, you know, as, right. as being valid, you know. Go ahead. But that's, I mean, doesn't the, you know, it says the information, the name and the address is confidential, so doesn't that mean that the police could not give out that information to the prosecutor? Well, if they're arresting a person, they're accusing them of a crime. Mm-hmm. And it means that your immunity from arrest at that point, pursuant to Section 4, no longer exists. And you're subject to what we call the public health code in the state of Michigan. You know, even though I disagree with this uh, interpretation, but the Supreme Court of Michigan has said the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act did not legalize medical marijuana, it merely created a exemption for limited behavior if the individual is acting in the specific uh, restricted types of behavior for for activity that would normally be illegal. So if you do not fall within the limited restrictions that would grant you immunity, you are what they would call a violator of the public health code. Or said another way, someone alleged of committing a manufacturing of marijuana, delivery of marijuana, and this is the way that it goes. So what happens then is you know, they are seeing you as just an individual who's got a card, you know, and they're taking the information, and your name is as the defendant. They're not calling you out as a 
patient. You know, they got to have a name on the court file. There's got to be a complaint written to a certain person. That person has to have certain, you know, constitutional rights. It's not so. You know, it may be things that are notated in the police report because they, you know, gathered that information. They found it. The individual had presented it, and it was taken down. But I don't know that they're disseminated. I don't know. I mean, you're right. It, it, yeah. It's a very, what are your thoughts, Jim? You got a thought on that? Well, I'm, I'm not really that familiar with the, the forms uh, in Michigan, but uh, I, I assume that when you apply to be a, a patient or a caregiver, they're, they're asking you name, uh, na- name, address, uh, the condition that, that the doctor is prescribing it for. It needs to be a condition that comes within the scope of the, the medical exception. Um, and then the card is issued. When the card is issued, it's, it doesn't name what the condition is, only that you are such a patient, correct? That's true, and I, and I think that's the point. Like, I, I want to make sure that I understand the caller's question because there are some, whether it's being followed or not is another question, but there is an intention in the law for the information not to be released by Lara, for example. Law enforcement yep. does not have access to it unless they have specific information, which would be a card and the card number. If they have the card, which would have a name on it, and the card number, they can call Lara and say, "Does this is this a valid card with this name?" And they have your driver's license. So with all those things, you know, it's a, it's a potentially way for you to be confirmed as an individual that would, be, you know, get the benefit of, of immunity from arrest, right? If you, know, you almost want that to be something, but beyond, but if they, but if it turns out that, you know, they, they wait and you've got three ounces instead of two point five, or your door's open, they want to arrest you. You know, every police report right. I, you know. So, Go ahead. I mean, but doesn't, you, you know, you're saying that Section 4 in that case would be gone, and I agree. But doesn't Section 8 still cover you as a patient protected by the MMMA? And then- Absolutely. Absolutely. Without question, and you would have a Section 8 defense. And here's the thing about all of that. You know, one would say the, uh, and it depends from where you're defending yourself. You're a caregiver versus a patient. And uh, there's not been enough, I would say, Efforts efforts to protect the patient's um, privacy and whatnot, but the problem is that you're in that conflict where, you know, especially in situations where the court, the judge is resisting the Medical Marijuana Act. You know, I kind of feel like yeah. the presentation has got to be as bloody and medical as you can make it. You know, I'll say to my client, right. "Listen, this is medical. They got to hear about it. You know, you got to complain. I want to hear if you're bleeding through your rectum, if you're throwing up regularly." You know, what kind of pain you're in, how you don't sleep. And, you know, I, I, you've got to get it all out to let them understand that it's medical. And I don't, you know, it's 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 very um, courageous of the individuals to get up and do this, you know. And uh, in a way, it, it educates the court. I mean, that's the most compelling thing. We've got to, you know, woo this judge. We've got to make this judge understand, you know, the medical side of it. And you've got to identify some of these conditions. I, I mean, I... Is, I'm, is the caller maybe asking why the... The name is not sealed. No, no, I'm asking. Cases? No, I'm, I'm. I mean, if everything is confidential in the act, and the act says, you know, that none of the other laws exist, you know, doesn't that mean that the police aren't able to share any confidential information with, you know, the prosecutor? I mean, that's my argument. Well, here's the here's the thing. I will say this. You know, the uh, the the crime is the dissemination of that information. Okay, so yeah. if it's gathered in the course of an investigation, that's one thing. Because and, and the only people that are going to it's going to be private. I mean, the law enforcement community is not going to necessarily um, provide that to anyone. Some of it becomes public records, and it can pro- possibly be gotten via a FOIA request. But they they Actually, would probably, right they would probably the redact. What's that? It says in the law that it is exempt from the FOIA request. Yeah, but I'm saying a police report. I'm saying if in a police report they say oh, you know yeah. Jim Smith and his patient number and he told us all this stuff, but he had three ounces instead of two point five, so we arrested him. We ignored his card, but here's all of his information. We found his card and his you know found his, uh, his me- medical yeah. records. And they, let's say all that's in the police file, which ends up in the prosecutor's file, which I would get as the attorney for the defendant or the patient in terms of discovery, but no one else is getting it, you know. And uh, yeah. I said, like, if someone had FOIA'd a police report, you know, and that would be part of it, I think that, you know, I think that the 
the records department would be aware that, you know, they should be aware anyways, that then disseminating that to like a news agency, patient information or records, then we got a crime going on. But kept within that circle of like the prosecutor's office and the assistant attorney for the prosecutor that's handling the case and the dissemination of it to the uh, defense attorney just because he's requested it on behalf of his client, so he's got all the discovery. I mean, I don't know. It, you know, I don't know if he can do it any other way and still have a fair shake of it, you know what I mean, in terms of... Uh, yeah. I, oh. Well, you can, but I, you can check out the forum, or you can check out the forum post. It's in the legal professional section. Yeah. I just want to say thanks uh, for the show and your answer. Thanks for the call. I, I, I hope I made a little bit of sense, but... All right, thank you very much. All right, so let's go to this other uh, 810 number. Calling in from 810. Welcome to the show, 810. Planet Green Trees. On with Jim Garrett of Garrett of uh, Leap. Very in recent speaker at the uh, Grass Lake uh, representative uh, Shirky event. Welcome. Thank you, Michael. Are you there? Yes, I am. This is Eric. Yep. Okay, yes. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, it's an... Uh, uh, I've, I've I've honestly uh, watched show, uh, watched your YouTube videos for years. And I've showed my friends, so I'm well familiar with the gym. I uh, I love the things that you have to say. I think you articulate well. Uh, I I've been a big fan, my friend. Well, thank you very much. I'm try <clears throat> um, to make it, make it clear and try to make things better for people, and uh, hopefully we're getting there. I just yes, want to say something I've, about I've, Eric. Eric has uh, been an activist in the. Uh, Cannabis Reform and Medical Marijuana Committee has actually gotten elected as the, uh, the township of Thetford Township. Thetford Township and uh, is now engaged in the political process and ran on a uh, medical marijuana, pro medical marijuana platform despite the uh, political advisors in and around the area telling him not to. <laughs> and, oh, uh, nice. He speaks That's from the true. position of the city council, so let's hear it. Well, I mean, he's not speaking for the city council. I'm not trying to throw any liabilities at you, but go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. Tell us. Uh, no, that, that's say. true. That's true, Michael. I mean, uh, many people said that uh, I wouldn't have, you know, that that would, uh, you know, be a political suicide to put that on my running platform. I said, no, I totally disagree, and I knew my county well, and I knew the, I knew the, I knew the community well, and I knew the feeling in the air uh, here, especially in Genesee County, Michigan, I think is probably one of the most uh, – uh, pro uh, medical marijuana, pro marijuana in general communities uh, in the state, I would have to say, and uh, we're, we're fortunate to be here. We have a pretty lenient uh, law enforcement. They they seem to have a pretty uh, understanding. You know, they're they're better, they're a better understanding anyway. But no, I I, I did uh, I did run for that election. I I won, and so uh, I'm doing trying to do my best to to try to bring this to light and also to help uh, create possibly a resolution or a ordinance in my community to be pro medical marijuana or at least make it lowest law enforcement priority. Well, uh, congratulations on the election and, and the things which you're seeking to do need to be done. And uh, I, I, I think you're going to be successful in getting it accomplished because uh, the, the, the pendulum is swinging and, and, and swinging in the right direction uh, that will make life safer and better for people not only who are sick but the public at large who have been cursed by a war on drugs for too long. Thank you, Jim. I'm I'm greatly honored to hear you uh, say that, um, especially coming from you. I've, like I said, I've, I feel like I know you. Have known you for years because I've, you know, been researching this. And when I found uh, Leap and and I saw, you know, what you, uh, what the organization and you guys had to say about it, I thought, wow. And I got to tell all my friends and let everybody know. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I say thank you. Well, well, and thank, thank you. I'm, I'm proud of LEAP. I'm proud of its statement of principles and the reasonable middle ground that it's taking in presenting uh, drug policy issues to the public, and, and, and you're a good example of what good can come of it. So thank you, Eric. Yes, thank you. And actually, uh, Jim, I may uh, want to get in contact with you more because I just spoke with a uh, Genesee County Sheriff the other day, and we had, she actually passed on my number to uh, her uh, higher official, to actually possibly have uh, me and uh, help, you know, discuss what could be done in the future about educating law enforcement about the medical marijuana law, and I told her I would be loved. I would love to orchestrate and put together something, and probably bring some people in, maybe have a panel discussion of some sort, and uh, I think it'd be very productive for law enforcement and in our community of Genesee County. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to book to me. 
Charmy's is the agent, I understand. <clears throat> she'll uh, she'll set that up. We do have about with the time we're going to go over a little bit because I just want to get a couple more things out of Jim. And thank you so much for your time tonight. And want to talk to and, and when we go past the hour, we got a lot listeners can't hear, but you can listen on the archive on the on the show. But anyways, um, you know Eric is calling from Genesee County. I mean, there's a multiple. You know, people would say that, that county, which includes Flint and Jim, your reference of Detroit being in the top ten of most violent cities in the country. I think year for at least two years in a row, Flint was the number one most violent city. So the question becomes like, you know, is Genesee County really, you know, pro marijuana or is it by necessity that they have to at least attempt to, you know, I think it's the most murders in the, I don't know. I may be wrong about that, but there's a lot of violent crime in the city of Flint. And, um, and, you know, I almost feel like, you know, this Holder announcement, Jim, this past week is actually uh, out of necessity, so to speak. You know, like when the sequester happened and they were posting the numbers of what was going to be reduced sure. of the DEA's budget, and you asked the question, you know, like they're reducing it two point two, you know, million dollars or, or whatever it was, or you know, and, and then you realize how much the budget is. Like, oh my God, that is so much money, and now they're going to take away money, and they can't get the job done anyways. There's something that's seriously wrong here now. Holder's announcement in this position did seem to, it does give him an out. And I even suggested that then, you know, the out for him is based on the money. You know, there's just a losing policy. There's better places that we can put it. And, um, you know, so is this a, is, is, there is a necessity argument in, in, some, in some jurisdictions. Sure. I mean, and, and, and really just about every jurisdiction. And the, the fact of the matter is that we have a drug policy of prohibition in place not only in the United States, but throughout the world, that causes the things that it was designed to prevent. And not only does it not help with the drug issue, but it's the heart of so many of the other crises. We tell the kids don't do drugs. We slide a pot of gold next to the choice. We tell them not to take. They're shooting each other, fighting over the money. That They're uninsured because they're in the drug business. We're getting the bills for the bullet holes that the public's asked to pay for. We catch some of them, so we got to lock them up and build prisons. We turn the country uh, uh, from a, the land of the free into the prison capital of the world. And, and all of these crises come with price tags. And it's not, it's not just the federal government that can't pay the bills, but uh, it was here like 48 uh, out of the 50 states were unable to pay their bills here in, in, in the last uh, couple of years. And uh, it, it's, it's not getting better because the drug war is still in place. And so some politicians are saying, well, we need we need cheaper ways. We're going to let more people out on ankle bracelets. So we need more people to be punished with community confinement or home confinement or some alternative thing other than prisons. So instead of looking at prohibition, which is precipitating the questions, we try to figure out how can we afford to keep this bad policy that causes the crises in place and, and do it and still pay the bills. And the answer is we can't. So Eric Kohler is saying the same thing that the president of the Cook County Board here in Chicago is saying. We can't pay the bills. We've got 10,000 people locked up in the Cook County Jail here in Chicago. We've got 50,000 inmates in the state of Illinois. Michigan has got 43,000 people and spending $2 billion a year can't pay the bills. California with 150,000. Texas with 150,000. Florida with about 130,000 inmates. We can't pay the bills. So Eric Holder is, is hopefully going to start the ball rolling where U.S. attorneys across the country will start using their discretion. And even although they have the authority to bring the charge, will have the good common sense economically to not be bringing the charge and said we're not going to go down this road anymore, at least for nonviolent drug offenders. Let, let me ask you this, and I don't know if this comes up or this is something that's even contemplated. <laughs> What impact since, you know, 2001 or the, you know, the increased war on terror, so to speak, what impact has that had on the war on drugs? Has it made it, what do you think? I mean, is that a, is that a fair question? Is that, does it, do they even work together? Well, I mean, I mean, I think you end up with all of these people uh, uh, doing these lookout jobs. You know, I go to the airport and I have to go through this uh, Homeland Security uh, that, uh, what do they call themselves, the Transportation Authority uh, or, or Transportation Security Authority, 
And 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 I, I when I go there, I say I want to fly high risk airlines. I don't want to have to go through these lanes. If the guy gets on the on the plane with the bag, I want to go with. Instead, we got all these people standing around again, watching people do nothing. Uh, it's impossible to 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 provide uh, uh, security for these people. But I, I see it just like so many people in the prison business. Um, and and it, it it doesn't work. It doesn't stop crime to, to be building all these prisons. It doesn't stop drug use. And I don't think you can make the airlines secure by making people go through all these things. Now, uh, they're, they're talking about now uh, uh, Homeland Security using the information and the tips that are coming in and turning them over to other law enforcement agencies where, where uh, the authority and the basis for the, the Homeland Security, quote-unquote, avoids the the warrant and the probable cause uh, requirements ordinarily necessary to get a warrant. And and so uh, there is some crossover where I think national security is being used as a way to get information and prosecution of people for drug crimes, which and, and then they, they hide and, and cover up the origin of the tip that it came from the National Security Agency, which, yeah, which there, there have been stories about in the press lately. Right, it was called that parallel construction theory, right? Where they were right, right. They they, they hide they hide where they got the information to begin with. It's not supposed to show up in the local police authorities' reports that you got this tip uh, uh, that, that watch out for this truck at a certain place in certain time, uh, and 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 so it looks like the case starts because the officer works backwards. He goes to that location, he sees the truck. The only reason he's there looking at it is because he got this this tip from Homeland Security or the, the, uh, the National Security Agency, and then they watch the truck and they look to see what basis can I stop this truck for? Oh, he's got one tire this low. Oh, his springs are out of adjustment. Uh, the load, uh, you know, he he ran, he didn't go through the stop sign properly. He didn't turn. He cut the corner. So now I've got a reason to stop the truck. And then when and when I find the drugs and I write the report up, I eliminate the fact that it was the National Security Agency who told me that this is the the truck that I should be looking for. And I rewrite the reports like the beginning of it was the fact that that he blew the stop sign. That's the reason I stopped him. Right. So right. it's skullduggery. It, it it is just another abuse which has been sanctioned, authorized, and encouraged. Uh, by, by this crazy war on drugs, uh, it just just undermines the entire integrity of the criminal justice system and and uh, our security agencies, uh, of which there are many. Well, that's a, that's what I'm thinking. I'm suggesting, like you know, the you know, there's you know, the ties to the drug, you know, the drug issues, the war on drugs being with uh, somehow a you know international issue of it coming in, you know, think you know, but they are they missing the point of the. The alleged demand is what may be bringing it in, instead of. But anyways, the the, the point is that the connection is made there, um, with, you know, the need for all this extra security, right? I mean, it kind of it, it's a basis to fund this law enforcement, you know, arm of our of our culture, that uh, amongst other things, other than you know protecting us against whatever that is, its war on terror, is also working on the. I mean, I almost see it like. They do kind of go hand in hand, and, I, and I, my fear, the biggest fear, is that as this continues and our civil liberties begin to, you know, continue to get suspended in moments of, you know, high-level security warnings, you know, that it just it feeds itself to the bigger uh, police, uh, you know, funding and, and you know, justification. You know, we're we're seeing a militarization of our police departments. We're seeing instead of knocking on doors, uh, busting through with battering rams, in order to try to get in there before they flush the stuff down the toilet. Uh, we 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 have an erosion of constitutional rights, an erosion of privacy. Uh, we we have dogs. Uh, you got to wait at your car while they go get the drug sniffing dog, and then they call it not a search. It, it's just such an abuse of civil liberties. And human rights, uh, giving police uh, a license to rough people up because it's a drug case and nobody cares because, oh, it's just a drug dealer. It's a human being. And we need to put the rules back in, 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 in law enforcement and public service that cares about the people and public safety safety and their and their health and their welfare 
and, and not just policing for a profit and, 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 and engaging in all of these schemes and hiding the beginning of a case because it's a tip from the National Security Agency. Anytime you're hiding part of the story, it, 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 it's just a red flag for something that's happening affecting civil and human rights that should not be happening. And the more we do and tolerate, the more that, uh, that America starts looking like a police state instead of a free society. You're like preaching from the uh, Bema, as they say. If you have to hide it from the courts, it should not be happening. <laughs> exactly. Listen, I know there's, there's someone else who's actually uh, one of the founders, I think, of this organization called the Human Solution. They goes from court to court and supports other uh, patients and caregivers who have been dragged into the system. Steve Green, uh, I know he wanted to at least get a couple words in with you. Jimmy, you've been so kind. I promise this will be the last caller. But, uh, Steve, go ahead. I know you got a question for... Uh, for uh, Jim. Yeah, hello. Thank you for having me on the show. You're welcome. It was nice to meet you last night, Jim. It was my pleasure. And uh, we're really proud of what you're doing. Um, obviously, we speak just from the, the marijuana front, but uh, I encourage you and, and your entire organization to keep up the hard work. Um, I think you're very insightful and, and you're doing the right thing. Well, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, I, I really enjoy what I do because I believe in it so much. Law enforcement against prohibition believes in it. People who used to fight this war on drugs who are now out there trying to right the wrongs that have been done, that have really warped uh, what was once a great society and can be again uh, as soon as we get this drug war ended. So, Steve, good to, to see you last night and I thank all of the, the people who participated in the activities that happened in, in Jackson County, uh, Michigan, yesterday. It was a wonderful uh, two days that I had there. Jim, I'm going I'm to let uh, you thank you very much, by the way. And we're going to have, stay, have Steve stay on and tell us some of the things that he reports on. But, Jim, I want to thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. And I, got, I do have to say one thing. I, mean, I think it was 2011. You remember we had that big rally at the Lansing Capitol, and I think you came on the show like that week or whatever. I kind of feel like your message is a little bit more, uh, kind of more edge to it. Not that it didn't before, but you seem to be a little bit more, I don't know. I mean, not that you weren't before, but I just feel like you're, you know, you're like on the sprint now. You know, we can feel it. It's right there. Did, does anyone else ever say that to you? Like you've gotten more, uh, you know, like I just felt, that you, you know, you were, you're calling it and there's no holding back. Well, it's a, it's a long time in coming, and I, I just think it's more apparent to more people, and it's it's it's, it's more mainstream. Where I think uh, some of the things I used to say a few years ago sounded rather strange and a little bit far out, and it certainly sounds more mainstream and more commonsensical, uh, even even though there's not really too much change in what I'm saying. To be frank, pretty well, much the same. I, I, I know one thing for sure when. Uh... Someone listens to the archive of this in five or six years. You know, I think that the words that we're saying, hopefully these won't be issues and this will be an adopted policy, but I think, uh, you know, these those words will hold even more true as we move forward. And I think uh, this is a good, you know, good message to look at as a real uh, reality, the reality of what's going on in our culture and the need for uh, absolute reform and uh, immediately because it's uh, it's been a loser. But, Thank you very much for coming on, Jim, and I always uh, enjoy speaking with you. And, all right, uh, my pleasure night. to be with you. I'm going to sign off, and good night to all. Thank you for letting all right. me be on. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good night. Uh, Jim, of course, uh, really staying to the very end. Wow, just uh, that was like a – took it all the way. Really appreciate him taking all the calls. But, all right, so we've left with uh, Steve Green, and I think uh, Eric, are you still on the air? And we can even get uh, Rick on. And uh, no idea who this 269 color is. Maybe it's, maybe it's Kevin. Who's that? Two six nine. Yeah, gotcha. Michael. Is that me? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Um. So we're all on. So we're going to wrap. Up. <laughs> Everyone's going to be on the wrap up right now. We're going to uh, break it down. We're way over our time. What time is it? And uh, this will all be on the archives and whatnot. But uh, everybody identify. Yeah. Steve, go ahead. You, you, Steve, you go first. Tell us the court report, and then we'll break it down from there. Everyone will have a chance to. Say their piece. Thank you, Michael. Um, tomorrow we have a gentleman, uh, David Overholt, 
from Mid Michigan Compassion. He's going to be in Grand Rapids Circuit Court at 9:30 a.m. Uh, today we had uh, Rachel Nichols up in Shiawassee County. She uh, is, looks like her Section 8 hearing is going to be in three segments. She's completed two, the second today, and the third will be on uh, 9-11 at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Saturday, uh, the 17th at 3 o'clock, coming up here in Hillsdale Courthouse. We're going to have a peace gathering. Um, then on the 21st, which is uh, next Wednesday, it'll be uh, uh, Maria Scheller, my wife, and me, Steve Green, in Oakland County at 8.30 a.m. for a consolidation motion and a Section 8 motion. On the 23rd, again in Oakland County, at uh, 8.30 a.m., we have the Argro case. And uh, on the 24th, which is a Saturday, we'll have our chapter meeting at the Clarion Hotel at 8.30 p.m. And uh, today I did my uh, first drug test that I was absolutely negative on. Uh, so stopping marijuana on June 4th, um, sometimes it appears if, if you're on a high dose and taking it internally, it, it can last a while in your system there. Uh, each each result came down and down, but it took all the way till this point to get a completely negative result. And uh, How long of a period was that? Well, from June 4th until today, um, to get a an absolute under five nanogram result. So a little over two months. And w one thing I wanted to add is um, this week we were able to hear three doctors testify. Each one of those doctors. Their testimony included the fact that they only recommend vaporization and marijuana in an edible form. Um, so I think that this is going to pose a large problem for, for Michigan's patients and caregivers. Um, if there's rulings made that, that kind of interpret what an edible form is or which section it's covered under or not covered under, um, it seems to be posing a problem for for doctors, um, and it looks like it'll be posing a problem continuing for a while here for the patients, um, since if your doctor recommends you medical marijuana and he tells you to use it in an edible form, um, that kind of puts you in a bind to follow your doctor's instructions, it looks like, coming up. Are we having technical difficulty? I hear some crackling here. I don't know. So, all right. So, um, of course, uh, you know, the but real problem with that uh, edible ruling. Real problem with that. We got some issues we gotta deal with. All right. So, Eric, Eric, and uh, Rick, are you guys still there? And uh... <clears throat> yeah, you want I'll, I'll uh, to say, Michael, that uh, first of all, it's cool having uh, Jim Garak on there uh, from Leap. That was really awesome. Uh, second today, uh, Michael, you were awesome today in court on that case. I got to tell you, buddy, you blew my mind. You you were just I I'm still in shock from it. I I can't congratulate you enough and 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 tell the whole world what an awesome and incredible a, a, attorney you are. And I, I had faith in you the whole time. I I tell everybody I say, you know, uh, it's a if it's a medical marijuana case, you know, my my attorney Michael Kamor can handle this. And I tell you. I told to, uh, your client today that, and she it was just an incredible uh, uh, turnout, Michael. And I, I just going through that and seeing it, uh, I know that you know I've got a lot of experience just in the courtroom, just ever since I've been following this and studying the medical marijuana law, trying to be as uh, as as legal in it as we possibly can, and uh, assert that our defenses properly. And, and just seeing how that unfolded today was just shocking, Michael. And I. I Congratulate you one more time. It's just a, it's a, you did an amazing job today, and, and you hit it out of the park. I appreciate well, I'm, it. I'm, I'm still on the line too, and I, I just wanted to give as far as final thoughts goes. Uh, uh, I'll echo Eric's sentiments that when we have attorneys that are doing groundbreaking work, that we should praise them whenever we get a chance to. Um, and Michael, I know that the Eric Holder thing may not have been the result of your fantastic uh, uh, work, perhaps. 
uh, more of a, a change in federal policy. But the fact of the matter is we're getting the information out there to the community. It's not a, a success that happens in isolation. Because of your continued 166-episode radio program, you're able to spread some of the successes that we have, not just from yourself, but from a lot of cannabis attorneys, out to, to uh, patients who may be listening on the radio hoping for some kind of a, of a lifeline or some kind of string of hope that they can put their hopes on. And, and we're providing that for, for patients across the state. By the same token, we're also providing some warnings about what could potentially happen. And I think that it was very interesting what uh, what uh, uh, Jim Garrett said uh, in regards to some of the things we have to watch out for. Um, but continue to be vigilant. Uh, that's what this program is all about. Uh, the meeting in grass was fantastic. <laughs> Once again, we're having representatives uh, 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 shoulder a bit of a burden for us by uh, going to bat for us. And these guys are not shrinking from the task. Representative Bailey in Lapeer County. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Irwin, Carlton, all the rest of the and, and we're seeing a lot of new faces join the chorus. Although 2013 may be a bit of a challenge, I think 2014, an election year, is much better looking for us, especially when we have so many polls showing the popularity of, ma of marijuana law reform. And once we have three cities successfully adopting it in 2013, November section, it'll be even more pronounced. So very encouraged by today's show. Great job, all, and thanks very much for, for educating the public on the import, things that are important to them. And I just want to add to that, uh, Michael, you know, about what Rick said. The, it, it's, it is a value that you, a huge value, that you, that you uh, an attorney, won a, a case for a client today that is now uh, a win for the whole state of Michigan because every case that follows from this day forward will now be backed up, and, and now this case, in addition to that, will be one of the cases cited. It's one of the, um, it's one of the you know, condition, or, you know, you don't understand, Michael. You can put it in attorney terms better than I can, but it is uh, a win for us all, and uh, I, I agree with Rick, and uh, thanks, Michael. It was a great show, and uh, I'm signing off as well. All right. Thank you for the kind words. I would say, you know, not to, not to turn all these nice words into a bad thing. I mean, if anything, it represents the disparity, you know, because what happened today, as it happens in many cases, it's a case by case basis. You know, you can't. It doesn't. It's not across the board. That's how criminal defense generally works. But one of the driving factors. So there's a lot of factors that were involved in terms of uh, the jurisdiction that it was in. You know, and that's one of the problems. Um, in the sense that I got involved in another case in a different county that uh, was not received well, and there was like retaliatory action in the worst type of situation I've ever seen in, in 20 years of practicing law. And, and, and you know, so I'm saying it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's a very uh, tenuous time right now. And the criminal justice system is brutal. Forget medical marijuana, forget the legalization. The system is a brutal part of it is because it's overwhelmed with these drug cases and what they're calling criminal activity that overwhelms the system. And they're trying to, you know, they've got three or four compartments. Push cases. Push cases. They've got three or four compartments that they've already been predetermined that every case either, that goes into in some way. And they don't have a, a, anything other to do with it. You know, and they're, uh, when someone thinks to them, you know, I was trying to explain this to someone earlier. Like, uh, someone thinks they're going to do it the creative way, they've got another thing coming sometimes. Like, the people that are dragged into the system are like, why the, why the hell am I here? I shouldn't even be here. Let me out. This isn't fair. But from the from the court's perspective, once you're dragged in, you're not getting out. Like very few people just get out. Like it's not like they just, you know what I mean? And, and they should. I mean, I've actually had some crazy cases recently that just like, you know, they just caved because I think it was they knew they realized where it was going. Today was one, you know, where we're like, look, they were gonna they, we, we drew a plea, you know. In another case that I had, we tried to withdraw the plea. They like wanted they locked my client up because he wanted to. One of his own lawyer that he's entitled to uh, have as a constitutional right, and uh, the judge was going to honor that, but for no reason, nothing to do with his bond, the court uh, punished him for making a cut. It's ridiculous that we're dealing with it. There was a lot of weird, crazy stuff, but the system is brutal. And uh, the most significant thing is that until there's some, you know, Quality, or at least some consistency of, of of what is allowable and what is not allowable. You know, 
serious due process violations are existing. I mean, in the you know, last couple of weeks on the show, we had the this discussion, you know, coming out of St. Clair County, the Amsdell case, and Stuart Friedman the week after, episode 160, arguing the Ferndale Clinical Relief, you know, uh, the appeal by the prosecutor's office of a dismissal. Now, think about that. Like, a case got dismissed on a legal issue. They got to waste money. They got to take it up. They got to make precedent. They got to, what? you know, what's their own purpose of it? They're just, so, I mean, obviously the jurisdictional issues, and some people, some of these, some of these uh, offices are going to fight it to the death. You know, they're going to try to create issues that are new issues so they're not disposed of and they can still continue the fight of some kind. But uh, I digress. We have such a good talk earlier. There are successes, and I do think that as terrible as it is, there are, you know, it's different It's different than it was, you know. The, the, and it's changing, and it will change. And, uh, you know, I think the... Uh, I think we just got to stick to the path. I think we'll see things developing, and uh, each victory is is going to be one city, one case, one county at a time. You know, and so we got to look at it. I agree. All right. Any final thoughts before we sign off here, and I and we uh, call it in on the uh, extra twenty five minutes so far? I'm glad we got to do it. You know, you got to get those questions in with Jim because it's such great content, isn't it? I mean, really did good. Yeah. I didn't mean. I, I hope I didn't insult him. I really didn't mean that. I felt like when I talked to him in the past, he was more reluctant to be negative about police, other police officers. That was my impression. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I felt today he was a, he was a little bit more open about that. You know, his once we got into the forfeiture. But maybe I'm mixing up with someone else from a week because Jamie remind me is he is he a was he a prosecutor in Illinois? Yes. And he's still he's a practice he's a lawyer practicing right now. So. But was he a police officer too? I, I've never heard that. I'm okay. not. I'm not sure. But you know what I mean? Like I, I felt like he. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you know, because you, you're right, that, Michael. He was a he was a prosecutor. Right, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'm being hypersensitive. Maybe I should stop talking about it. But I, I felt like you know some of the elite policies. We don't badmouth police officers. You know, we don't say that they're. And I don't know that he was per se, but I just felt there was less. He seemed to be more more uh, like I. You know, as a defense lawyer. I say a lot of times, you know, they're lying. Everybody knows they're lying. It's just a question of if you're going to catch them or not. You know, everybody that goes in there knows they're lying. The judge is like, well, you caught them there, but that's not good enough. Try again. You know, keep going. I'm almost there. No, you know, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because he said it. He said it, counsel. That means, how can I say, how can I believe that that's not true? You know, that kind of stuff. And I, you know, so I've been there. That's part of the game. You know, it's, it's just a question of how you're going to get them. And, um, so, but, but I, you know, but that doesn't mean that uh, I don't think I don't know. I don't know what it means. But uh. well, Representative Shirky made it clear when people started kind of getting down a little bit on the uh, prosecutor that uh, in no way did he want to, uh, you know, say anything negatively about the uh, the police and the enforcement agencies and things like that. And it was kind of brought up and discussed, and, and uh, Jim Garrick was a part of that. That it was mainly policy by a few people who sit in a position of power, and not you know the men and women who make up the police force. And they were talking about real problems that result from the drug war and how they have to respond or how they their policy is to respond to these things. It was put to a, to a decent context. I don't. I don't. I understand. And the idea is, you know, while while we don't, uh, you know, we don't really want to accept uh, the idea of, uh, you know, it's justifiable just because someone's doing their job. I mean, there's like a moral issue there, of course, and. You know, when you hear that, it's it's become scary. Oh, sorry, we gotta kill you. I'm just doing my job. I mean, when when does it end? You know, when, you know, it's a very slippery slope to be able to just allow a policy to dictate, you know, immor 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 immorality. And um, but uh, there's probably a lot of truth to that in the sense that the you know there's a loyalty amongst the police force to you know, follow the directions of that. And that's an important aspect of law enforcement. You know, if it's, if it's going to be successful, it's going to be that they're going to. And, um, but the problem is that the law is so terrible, you know, that, uh, you know, but, but it's being used and abused, obviously, and, and it's become the focus, focal point of all that. But uh, I do think, though, however, the message, as, as uh, Jamie alluded to and Shirky, I mean, to really, thrive in this instance, it's not going to be the screaming and yelling. It's not going to be the going after the police officers. It's not going to be doing that. You're going to have to give them the benefit of the doubt. You're going to have to try to educate them. You're going to have to let them say their piece without interrupting them. You've got to let them, 
you know, let them say it and realize that what they're, you know, in their own mind it'll go off because they realize what they're saying is bullshit. And it's not working. And it's not working. When you yell and holler at the police officers, they really uh, enjoy that because they just stand back and cross their arms and look at you and go, ah, ha, ha, I'll get you later. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an opportunity, of course, you know, uh, to do that. Um, I do, uh, I think one of the more enjoyable things of uh, being a uh, criminal defense lawyer is the opportunity to cross-examine police officers and get down on it, you know what I mean, and just kind of see where it, uh, get you. yeah, where it's going to go. Yeah, especially when you know that they are going to say something false on the stand. And you know, that's why it's such that's why it's such a drag that a gentleman like Ferguson in Oakland County just loses his job and doesn't have to get on the stand to explain why his his bad behavior cost Oakland County eighteen different cases and perhaps prejudiced many, many more. Simply from firing that guy they, they, they didn't accomplish what you're saying you need to do, Michael, and that's question the the uh, detectives involved. I'd love to see a little bit more oversight so we have greater greater uh, results like we did with the Monroe police officer of uh, forfeiture case recently. Luke Davis. Yeah. Correct, yes. In fact, Luke Davis. Thank you. You know, you know I don't know I don't know if it's something that uh you know it's one of those scenarios like we're so much more t- we're tied into so many more news outlets so there's all this other information that's coming and most of us probably get some similar feeds and you know it's in the realm of the interests that we all share. But seemingly there seems to be a story every day or every other day about some terrible police situation, doesn't there? I mean, I don't know if those are regular occurrences or, and they always have been, I would think that they are, but it seems like more they're getting caught more frequently and it's being made public more frequently. You know what I mean? Like it's a, I think, you know, like the, it's not so much of a, uh, I mean, the concept of it being a police state and there being, you know, police overreaching and too much money and, you know, becoming is not such a fanatical or extreme, you know, conspiracy theory kind of thing anymore. Does anyone take issue with that? Also also about uh, the rise of social media, too. I mean, uh, the the fact is that in the past, a small uh, minor paper story now can become national news simply because a couple of key people get behind it and start to promote it. Um, hyper local media, it's called, and it's very effective as a means of getting the news out. Also, I think the uh, very important Supreme Court decision, which is that anybody can videotape anybody in public, no matter what they're doing, and nobody can do anything about it, whether it's police or otherwise, has allowed some sense of uh, civilian protections for other civilians. You know what I mean? Like, can you imagine yep. if the police were allowed to confiscate the cameras? What kind of, you know, but but just the, of course that should be the case, but who knew, who knows? But because of that, there is some, you know, when someone gets caught, you know, it's like, thank God there was a camera there. You know what I mean? And how many of those got, got uh, by everybody when there wasn't a camera there? I know we've we known for years and years and years about police abuses that were never caught on tape because um, uh, they, they, the technology didn't exist. Now that it does, we're in that period of adjustment between what they used to be able to get away with and what they commonly have to accept um, because of the potential of anybody to iPhone these people anytime they're doing something wrong, like beating the guy down or or improperly doing a search. Um, And also sometimes it works to the officer's benefit because if there's a a dispute that uh, perhaps lands them on the other side of the defendant's chair, they can they can say no I didn't inappropriately touch this person and look here's some some YouTube video that proves it so lots of lots of uh, pros and cons on that but I love the fact that that we're protected by Supreme Court law now not just as media persons but as everyday persons in what we need to do yes all right so let's wrap it up anyway final thoughts Jamie real quick. Uh, Shirky also mentioned that he's willing and looking into a uh, industrial hemp to, as a bill as well. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that is a <coughs> so I can get the I don't know. We, we got to do that another show. All right. Good. Good points, Jimmy. Dewey, preoccupied. Chad, any final thoughts? I, I'm pretty pretty good. All right. Good then. Well, thank you everyone for listening for this totally a two hour and thirty four minute 
overwhelming amount of information in one show. But uh, thank you for listening, and uh, everybody be safe, and we will talk at you next week. Thank you.